in my main career, I was director of primary operations and plant manager for Oregon, Metallurgy Corp Man Oregon Metallurgical Corporation in Albany. I've been billed in this forum as providing a business perspective, but I don't look at my business perspective as being different from my perspective as a community member. Um, I find it a little bit difficult to do. Uh, I, I like live audiences. So I'm, I'm showing you a picture of what I'm actually is pasted on the wall in front of me, uh, grandchildren. And that's actually uh, what this is all about is uh, if we do things successfully, we will make things better for our grandchildren. Uh, my, pre my presentation will follow this outline. Um, why consider changing the system? Uh, uh, it's not surprising, uh, the cost. Uh, why does healthcare cost so much in the US? How could universal care help? How could the financial transition to universal care work? In terms of real dollars, we are paying more than 10 times as much for healthcare per person as we did in 1960. Are we getting 10 times the value? I don't know, but I do know that in grade school in 1956, I shouldn't admit that, I learned that the three human essentials are food, clothing, and shelter. But literally out of nowhere has come a fourth essential, which is now dominating. The per capita cost of care hasn't always been double the average of other industrialized countries. It's gotten there gradually and the effects are significant. U.S. is number one in poverty rates, rates of poor health, rates of suicide from desperation over the cost of health care, number one in loss of jobs for lower middle income workers as employers have to include our high cost of health care in decisions of whether to employ, automate, outsource, or eliminate jobs. The rising cost of health care detracts from everything else we do. Every new dollar going into healthcare is a dollar that used to go somewhere else. As individuals and communities, we are gradually losing our choice to spend money on other things of value. What are we currently doing about the problem of high cost? We're using the uniquely American strategy of trying to outspend it. The ACA successfully serves more people, but, an, but at an even higher cost per person. The ACA will continue to increase how much more we pay than other countries. Where does the extra $5,000 per person go compared to other countries? Not many researchers have taken on this full question, but an article published in JAMA by Dr. Irene Papanicholas of the London School of Economics offers some specific insight. Dr. Papanicholas and her co-authors compared large medical data sets between countries and concluded that our relative response to specific diseases is actually about the same as other countries. Cost difference isn't in what we do, it is in what we pay for substantially the same services. The article identifies three areas which account for almost all of the $5,000 extra. Using industry data, it is possible to estimate the cost of various components of our healthcare delivery system. About 70 to 72% of the costs of healthcare is labor. Drugs and other supplies are 15 to 20%. Net cost of insurance, also known as financial administration, is reported to cost about 12%. Facilities, utilities, liability insurance, and profit are also shown here with an estimate of their contribution to the total cost. This is based on an aggregate of all types of services. Some individual service groups will be higher or lower in their specific distribution of cost. With Dr. Papanicholas's help, our U.S. expenditures can be compared to the average of other countries. While, some, while there are some significant percentage differences in the amount paid for facilities, utilities, liability, insurance, and profit, 
These are smaller components of the total cost. Getting into the three major categories identified by Dr. Papanicholas, we spend on the order of 10 times as much on financial administration. We spend up to two and a half times as much for the same drugs and supplies that other countries purchase for less. And because labor is such a large category, even a smaller percentage difference in wages and salaries eats up a lot of money. According to Dr. Papa Nicholas's study, specialists make three to five times as much in the US. Primary care physicians make about double. Nurses, technicians, and therapists make 15 to, 15 to 50% more than in other countries. As Dr. Papa Nicholas points out, this higher wage rate for professionals in the US is not unique to medicine. It is also true of other, of other specialties like engineering. Simply put, a problem that we have in the US is that we have a wider spread between the incomes of those who provide medical services and the incomes of average people who need to purchase those services. By subtracting the columns in the previous graph, here is a reasonable estimate of where our $5,000 per person extra money goes compared to other countries. This shows financial administration as being a little lower than the other two, but this graph does not include the full amount of time spent on billing, on billing and insurance paperwork by medical providers under the labor category. It would be best to consider these three main causes of higher cost in the US as being approximately equal in magnitude. Any attempt to bring our costs more in line with other countries will need to be focused on these three areas. How do we address those costs? Let's start by considering some history. In 1960, most medical care was paid for out of pocket and medical insurance was on for only for catastrophic coverage. The shift since then has been dramatic. As the cost of care has risen, Medicare and Medicaid programs have been made necessary due to the increasing cost of people who could not afford private insurance. The top three sources of Oregon's approximately 40 billion in medical expenses are now private insurance, Medicare, and Medicaid, two of, the, of which did not exist in 1960. Medicare and Medicaid have not effectively controlled total costs, only shifted it. Here is a schematic demonstrating that the need for healthcare service increase, increases as we age. Prior to Medicare, individual costs and insurance policies were getting very expensive for older people based on the amount of care they use. Medicare Act of 1965 address the high cost of older people by transferring a significant portion of that cost onto people under age 65 in the form of Medicare taxes. Because the cost of providing health care has riven, risen faster than Medicare taxes or Medicare premiums, seniors are now paying less and less of their actual costs and more of the cost is coming out of the general fund budget paid mostly by people during their working years. Medicare payroll taxes and, and Medicare premiums now only account for about half of the total cost of Medicare services. Of the six ways in which we fund healthcare, the rise of Medicare and Medicaid funding through general taxes has made income taxes the fastest rising source of healthcare dollars. Just as Medicare began by shifting cost onto people under age 65, the continuing growth in Medicare and Medicaid has resulted in shifting more of the cost onto higher earners through these income taxes. Dividing Oregon taxpayers into five quintiles or equal size groups with the top quintile having an income of more than just over $100,000 shows that the current cost of healthcare is being significantly carried by the top 20% of earners this trend is accelerating. Our ability to continuously shift the cost onto younger people and onto people with higher incomes has allowed the US to avoid doing anything serious about the basic problem, the unsustainable rise in the cost itself. 
This is what makes universal care based on a single risk pool, single payer system, different from the other things that we've already tried. It is based on reducing the cost of healthcare while maintaining our high quality of care. Imagine walking into a hospital or major clinic and never being asked to fill out an insurance form, ever seeing a bill because there is no bill. Hospital or major, major clinic gets an annual budget to take care of its patients. No bills, no cash registers, no co-pays, no deductibles, and in fact, no billing department. Not only would insurance costs be significantly reduced, the part of provider labor that is currently being spent on payment paperwork would go down. By sharply reducing individual billing costs in this way, we could save about $1,200 per person per year, possibly much more as the full efficiencies come into play. And if a single pool, single payer system could purchase drugs and other supplies at the same price as the VA and other countries, we could save an additional, an additional $1,200 per person for a total of $2,400 per person or over $7,000 savings for a three person household per year. Acting as a community, we could spend say $1,400 of our individual savings on providing full coverage for every person in the state and still have $1,000 per person left over. This opportunity is compelling from both a financial and a humanitarian standpoint. What would it take to create a universal care system in Oregon? We'd have to change some thinking about assigning costs to specific patients. We'd have some community planning to do, and we would need to have public acceptance of a different way to fund healthcare. In Oregon, we pay about 40 billion in total healthcare costs. About half of that comes from private insurance and other direct private payments. And about half comes from Medicare, Med Medicaid and other government programs. A universal care single payer system would presumably require that both these systems funnel their payments into one combined medical disbursement program. On the public side, there is a bill currently being in, introduced in Congress to enable the federal government to pay into a state-based universal care program out of Medicare and Medicaid and other programs. On the private side, it is most commonly proposed that the easiest way to direct this revenue into a single payer system is to replace current premiums and out of pocket with a state healthcare tax. By combining the public and private sources into one universal, fund, universal funding system, we could provide care to everyone, save a significant amount of money in the process while dramatically reducing complexity. It really is a bold idea. When savings are taken into account, we would only need to convert say 16 or 18 billion to replace 20 billion in current private spending. Most people have a hard time envisioning what $16 billion looks like. So consider that the entire amount of income tax collected to run the state of Oregon in 2015 was just over 7 billion. This means that an Oregon healthcare tax would need to be two to three times the size of the income tax that funds our, our state government. Would voters ever go for a tax that large? One of the key questions asked in the Elway poll of Oregon voters in 2019 was this, would you be inclined to vote for a ballot major that established full lifetime health care, including vision, dental, and hearing for every person in Oregon with all medical expenses paid by a state agency, meaning no private insurance premiums, co-pays or deductibles, and funded by a new state health care tax, two to three times as much as Oregon's income tax funded government. The rather surprising poll result is that 62% said they would definitely or probably vote in favor. Business owners and self-employed sometimes assumed to oppose such a program polled 60% in favor. 
majority support for universal health care funded by a state health care tax held across all five of Oregon's congressional districts. District 2, which voted for Donald Trump almost two to one over Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden, polled almost as high as other districts for a large health care tax to provide health care to everyone. And somewhat surprisingly, while the Democratic Party regards universal care as its own issue, the majority of favorable responses in the poll came from unaffiliated Republican and third party voters. One thing the poll did show is that support for universal care tax in Oregon is very age dependent. There was no net support above age 50, possibly due to worries that a new program might affect Medicare. But similar polls to this had shown as many as 80% of seniors to be opposed in years past. So option, so opinions may be shifting. How could an Oregon healthcare tax be designed? It would need to be of sufficient size, would need to be a relatively stable in economic ups and downs. Taxes can generally be divided into three categories, taxes on income, such as income taxes and payroll taxes, taxes on transactions such as sales taxes or taxes on wealth tax, taxes on wealth such as property taxes. There are other specific taxes such as excise taxes on beer, wine, marijuana, et cetera, but these are all far too small to be considered. Sales tax would probably make good economic sense, but it's been unpopular with Oregon voters. Many people argue that sales taxes can be regressive. Wealth taxes are difficult to design on a state basis. Since much wealth is tied up in property, Oregon's constitutional limits on property taxes largely rules out wealth tax in Oregon. For these reasons, most attention, but not all, for funding universal care in Oregon has been given to a tax based on income. Looking at the breakdown of all taxable income in Oregon, this happens to be from the year 2015, wages typically constitute over 70% of Oregon's total income with a remainder made up of retirement income, regular business income, C corporation business income, capital gains, and dividends and interest. Right away, you can see from the graph that raising $16 billion by taxing $7 billion in capital gains is not, is not inadequate to raise uh, the money. Besides the size of the tax base, stability is very important. This graph shows what happened to various types of income in the Great Recession beginning in 2008. Capital gains fell 72% and took more than five years to recover. Corporate income fell 44%, dividends and interest fell 43%, income of the top 1% fell 34%, while total wage income only fell 4% and recovered more quickly than other sources. Retirement income actually grew, possibly because of people retiring early due to job loss. A tax principle featured in T.R. Reed's book, A Fine Mess, is the principle of BBLR or bubbler, which stands for broad-based low rate. Its concept is that you find something to tax that applies to virtually everyone, like household income, and you don't allow hardly any exclusions or deductions or credits. The key part of the bubbler principle is to tax all income at the same rate, thereby minimizing the ability to game the system. Here is an interactive calculator developed for Oregon, which allows people to experiment with different combinations of taxes just by pressing a few errors, a few arrows. Send me an email, I will send you the spreadsheet. You can have fun designing all the taxes you want. Shown here is one example that raises 16 billion by spreading the cost over a collection of revenue sources. A $100 per month premium collected for persons above the poverty level, a 9.8% tax collected both on payroll wages and also on other sources of personal and business income, 
a 2% extra tax on income above the threshold of the top 1%, a 2% extra tax on income of class C corporations operating in Oregon. One thing to remember though is instead of just to start designing a task, a tax, we should remember that we already have a funding health, a funding uh, means that raises more than enough money. So rather than starting fresh, designing a new tax, a more functional approach is to start with the current system and then to consider who, if anyone, should pay less or pay more in the transition to a new system. Let's take age as an example. Here is a schematic of the current system. People under age 65 pay premiums and other expenses based on their age rating. I can relate to this graph by comparing two of my friends. One age 23 is paying about $3,000 for medical coverage. Another age 63 just quoted 17,000 per year for an insurance policy. The one paying 17,000 isn't necessarily being overcharged. That is pretty close to the average cost of medical services provided to someone of that age. By the way, people over age 65 currently pay for a subsidized rate based in part on having paid Medicare taxes prior to retirement. So how would we transition this cost to universal care? This goes back to the discussion of what is the primary purpose of universal care? Is the primary goal to renegotiate payment in a way that changes who pays? This is the same strategy that was used in the past for Medicare and Medicaid. Or is the primary goal of universal care to reduce the cost of health care for everyone with part of the savings going to pay for better care for people who currently don't have adequate coverage? If we focus on evening out the effect of people paying at different rates in order to change who pays, the average cost for my 63-year-old friend will be a cut in about a half, while cost will more than double for my 23-year-old friend. Charging everyone the same sounds nice in concept, but it will set up a fight. Of course, it would be nice for the 63-year-old not to have to pay so much, but for the 23-year-old just starting out and raising children, an extra $5,000 per year could be arguably devastating. The 63-year-old, after all, got through their 20s paying comparatively almost nothing for health care, and that's perhaps why they own a house and have other uh, savings. Adding to this uh, argument is the question of seniors. Depending on their income, seniors might be asked to carry more of the community costs some of this increased cost could be offset by new dental hearing benefits, as well as no longer needing to buy supplemental policies. But on the other hand, if the goal is to save everybody money, we don't need to spend time arguing about the transitional shift. We can just design the new system to look a lot like the old system, but with everybody paying less than they do now. And hopefully continuing to pay less as more cost savings from a universal system come into play. Likewise, consider the transitional effects based on income. If we want to reduce the cost for everyone, then these bars showing the current system just get uniformly shorter. On the other hand, there are voices demanding further cost shifting according to income. One of the main recommendations being considered by the task force is the current private premiums shown here in blue should be replaced with a progressive income tax, which has a different distribution. The effect of that change is shown here with costs cost being cut for the first four quintiles and the cost burden on the top quintile rising to 75%. There is a question whether this is reasonable or even possible. Many people would strongly object to such a dramatic cost shift, which would be the largest ever contemplated in the United States. For anyone who believes that the transitional shift should be kept small, designing this way will be politically difficult. Groups will be fighting very hard 
to make their case that they deserve more of the benefits and less of the cost. Some groups will use their muscle to say that they will not support universal care unless they get special concessions. This is where any design groups needs to choose some principles and be prepared to stick with them. Designing a funding system for universal care breaks down to a few decisions. Do you want to concentrate on cost savings or concentrate on cost shifting? Do you want a broad-based low rate tax or do you want a high rate focus tax? Do you want to continue a focusing on employment-based healthcare or do you want to focus on moving healthcare to income and profit? Is the goal to make a bold statement by instituting big changes or do you want it to feel just about the same except it may be just changing where you send your check? Is it better to have sudden changes and get over with it? or to set a path of gradual changes. Finally, in making decisions, the bottom line is that equity is a natural part of a well-planned universal care system and must be protected. Nobody likes designing taxes. I will close with an old quip that the only fair tax is one which is paid by people we don't know personally, probably wouldn't like anyway. But in considering healthcare funding, we need to balance that with the kind of thinking the basic fact that there is nobody here but us. We will either provide care for our communities or we will not. The rising cost of health care in the U.S. is economically damaged and unsustainable. If people want quality care with full access at a more affordable cost, people will need to tolerate some degree of change. The Elway poll that shows that Oregon voters in general are probably ahead of the political system in their willingness to consider changing to a universal care system. Thank you. Here is my email address. I do welcome correspondence. I have made the complete Elway poll report available at variedstrengths.com.